What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Behind the Facade. This is going to be a shorter than usual episode, I expect, because I am off on my holidays this evening and I'm trying to record this and get it out to you guys for Monday. And, uh, and so there's going to be a bit of a, a rush and trying to throw it t together today. And um, hopefully this will come off and you'll think it's a good, helpful episode. So a couple of weeks back, I did an episode on overseas property investment and whether or not you should buy foreign property. And I think it's like three or four weeks back if you go back to it. And clearly we have a very diverse audience uh, from all over the world. And I know that because I get the, 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 the stats for the podcast and I can see that we have listeners in the UK, Australia, America, as far flung as China, India, South Africa, Brazil. I mean, it's all over the world. And, uh, but mostly we have a, an Irish audience because of my nationality. And so one of the things that um, is interesting is the amount of Irish people out there in the world working in different places. And they somehow come across this podcast and they send a question to me. And so this week I'm dealing with a question that I've received from an Irish, a fellow Irishman living in the Cayman Islands. And he had a really interesting question. And he was saying that, you know, he's thinking of moving back to Ireland at some stage, living in the Cayman Islands for the last number of years. And he's paid in US dollars. But obviously, if he decides to buy back home, he's going to be uh, paying in euro for the home. And the fact is, this past week, Ireland, or not Ireland, but the euro and the US dollar hit parity. And it hasn't been, there hasn't been parity between these currencies for ages, if at all, since the euro came about. And so today I'm going to be talking about the things that you have to watch out for, the currency risk, and the things that you just need to kind of consider if you are looking at doing a transaction in another country with another currency. I mean, whenever I, when I talked about foreign investment, I was thinking about the fact that people would be buying, say me as an Irish person, looking at the south of Spain where I have a house. I'm in euro, paid in euro, buying in euro in the south of Spain. And so it doesn't really make a difference to me. However, I did own an apartment in New York many years ago. And so I have some experience and I'm going to go and take you through that today. So look, without further ado, sit back and listen to my lesson on the impact of currency exchange rates on your property investment decisions. You are listening to Behind the Facade and I'm your host, Gavin J. Gallagher. On this podcast, I explore the mental and emotional game often playing out subconsciously both in your mind and the mind of everyone else in the real estate or property investment market. The key to success in this game is to master your mindset and behavior, to take control of your thoughts, your emotions, and most importantly, your ego. Welcome to the show. All right, guys, let's get into this topic. And um, what I'm going to do today in this talk is I'm going to actually split it into two parts. And the first part, I'm going to discuss my experience of buying an apartment in New York City. Now, I've talked about that before. Um, in the past, but I've never gone into the currency risks and all, all of the kind of experiences around currency. And then part two of the talk is going to be around um, just the lessons that I learned in that and I guess uh, some of the takeaways that um, this listener and any of you guys that are considering buying in a foreign currency can take away and just to make sure you're aware of it if you do happen to look at buying in another currency. Getting into the first part, my experience. I've talked before about my purchase of a lovely penthouse in New York City. And as I've mentioned in the past, that was a purely emotional decision. It wasn't really an investment decision. I, I mean, I looked at the rental return and it was about 4%, which comparatively doesn't, didn't sound out of kilter with the Irish market that I was familiar with. And it was really down to the fact that as a teenager, I had visited New York and it made such an impression on me that I decided I wanted to live in New York when I was older. 
And whereas I didn't actually end up living in New York, I did want to own a property there. And I had this kind of romantic idea that I would own the apartment uh, outright. I would have enough money that I could basically fly over whenever I want and just stay in my own pad. And that was that was the kind of extent of it. And I kind of thought to myself, I'm going to want to create a, a U.S. based property portfolio and then I'll have a good excuse to fly over to the U.S. and stay in my apartment frequently. And my brother at the time was living in New York, so I did kind of see a reason for that. Now, an opportunity arose back in 2005. And in 2005, uh, I had made a fair bit of money on a couple of transactions. So I had cash sitting in the bank. And I heard about this opportunity in the Rockefeller Center in Midtown Manhattan. Now, anyone who's familiar with New York will know that, you know, the Rockefeller Center is like dead center in the middle of the universe there. And it's where the ice rink is at a Christmas time. It's a big, you know, it's a, it's a really lovely place um, built back in the 1930s. And it's kind of, it's really well established. So I found this apartment in the, uh, it was a top floor. It was a penthouse, but it was only a small apartment. It was one that was so sandwiched in between these much bigger penthouses. And so I had my one bedroom top floor apartment and the price at the time was 1.475 million for a one bedroom apartment and uh, for this for the ease of this discussion today around prices and all that I'm just going to round it up to 1.5 million dollars and the reason I'm doing that is because there were closing costs and the closing costs actually came in at I think it was 58,000 dollars and that's for fees taxes various charges there's a thing called the new york city mansion tax all of these things and they really do add up between your legal fees and insurances and things like that so i ended up paying the 1.475 plus an additional 58,000 in closing costs now the base price let's just take the 1.5 million rounded up and that was in june 2005 that i discovered the property was coming on the market for sale in fact the building was under construction. Delivery was being sort of slated for 2007. And I thought to myself, this is great. I can put a deposit down now. And then in 2007, I'll take you know ownership of the property. And by that stage, I was expecting various other deals to kind of come through. And so I'd have even more money and I'd be able to you know, enjoy the benefit of the apartment by that stage. Anyway, 1.5 million US dollars at the exchange rate that it was back in 2005, June 2005, the exchange rate was 0.8154. Now, that equated to 1.23 million euro. And so $1.5 million, 1.23 million euro. Now, the rental return at the time was around $5,000 a month. And I worked that out to be about 4%. So it's not too bad, actually. 4% return on your investment is about what you'd kind of expect. And uh, so from my point of view, I decide, yes, let's go again. How do I reserve this property for myself? So what I did was um, it was a 15% deposit required. And so I thought, okay, let's go ahead and do this. I've, I, I've kind of looked at it. It looks like an amazing area. The quality is going to be pretty high. And so I thought looked like a solid investment so 15 percent of 1.5 million is 225 thousand dollars and in the euro rate of exchange again that worked out at 183 thousand euro and so i transferred this 183 thousand euro over to the us anyway fast forward two years and we get to 2007 and construction is complete and I get this email and it says, you know, the, your, your apartment is now ready. Please close the deal in the next 30 days or whatever. So the balance due, I've already paid the 15%. The balance due is $1.275 million. Now, by this stage, the exchange rate has actually fallen off. And the exchange rate now is, before it was 0 0.8154, now it was 0 0.7355. So what the great, the good thing about that, in my view, was that my apartment was now 120,000 euro cheaper than when I had put down the deposit. And so instead of paying 1.23 
million euro, I was now only going to have to pay 1.1 million euro. And that's still a lot of money, obviously, but 120,000 reduction in the price when I had secured the property. And so that to me was like, first of all, I, I felt great that I had this apartment in New York. But second of all, now I'm actually saving money. I've secured it. It's still the same US dollar price, but for me paying in euro, it's actually fallen by 120,000. So I felt like a bit of a, a winner um, in that regard. The only thing I wished was that I had actually held off paying the 15% deposit until the same time, because had I done that, I would have actually saved almost 20,000 in, instead of having to send 183,000 deposit, I would have been able to send 165,000 deposit for the same amount of money in dollars to be received at the other side. Let's fast forward any a bit further, and I am now in the process of transferring these funds over. And now, of course, the fact that I'm up 120,000, that made me feel great, but the swings and roundabouts that happen in currency exchange, it could have gone the other way. And I could have been sitting there kind of sobbing over my cup of coffee thinking, I can't believe I've secured this. I've paid a deposit now and now I have to find another 120,000 that I didn't expect to have to pay. So you got to take the swings uh, and the roundabouts like in these transactions if you start to play with currency. Now, I did a deal with a company called Oakwood and Oakwood basically took the property off me and started renting it. And they were paying me 5,000 a month and they gave me a three year deal. And I didn't have to furnish the property or anything. So that was a great start as far as I was concerned. And what I did was, um, by the way, just, just to go back and mention that I actually paid cash when they asked me to send over the balance. I, I actually had cash sitting in my bank. And so I just said, okay, I'll send cash. So I sent over um, one point it was basically a million euro um, was sent over in cash and that closed out the transaction. But I didn't want to tie up that much money in that apartment. So what I did was, as soon as I secured this rental deal with Oakwood, I wanted to get a mortgage. And so I started looking around for a mortgage. Now, one of the things you guys have got to remember when you're buying foreign property is the mortgages are not going to be coming from where you live. They're going to be coming from where the property is located. And that is because, legally speaking, a bank with a mortgage has a security against the asset itself. Now, if you go to an Irish bank and say, I'd like to buy an apartment in New York, they'll you know, pretty much laugh you out of the building because they can't get security really on that asset. But they'll give you a loan all day long in the Irish market because they can get security over the asset. If they've got to hire you know, legal firms in the US and all that kind of stuff to kind of chase after title deeds and stuff. It just becomes a mess for them. So most of the time, you're going to have to resort to uh, borrowing in the local currency. And that is exactly what I had to do. The only thing is, is how do you find a mortgage provider in another jurisdiction, especially if you're not used to it? Now, my brother was living there, so I was actually able to knock on a couple of doors and get a couple of introductions but as it turned out, I had a relationship with Anglo-Irish Bank. Now, Anglo, to those of you in the Irish market who were old enough to know, Anglo was basically the, the bank that nearly brought down the Irish economy back in 2008. But I was a good customer of theirs at the time. And so they offered me a U.S. mortgage. They had a U.S. branch. And they said to me, Gavin, we can give you $750,000 and, uh, and and secure it on the asset in New York City. So that to me sounded like the perfect opportunity. So I went ahead and I did that deal. And what it meant was that they took out the 750 grand, I had put 1.5 million in, and they gave me back half of it. And when I converted that into euro, I ended up with 550,000 euro getting back. So of the million in cash that I put over, I got 550 back. Now. Not quite, actually, because there are when you take out a mortgage, uh, there are all sorts of fees for registering the title and the security and all that. So actually, of the 750 that loan that I got, 22,000 of that went into these fees and uh, various charges for securing the title. Um, but let's just keep it simple and just leave it at that. Now, had I taken out my mortgage in 2005, 
the um, my five hundred and fifty thousand that was worth seven fifty in two thousand and seven, my five hundred and fifty thousand euro would have only got me six hundred and eleven thousand dollars. So you can see how it the timing really does make a big big difference. And so you but you at the end of the day you can't game this out. You have to make a decision. You have to act like the the bank are asking for money there and then. You've got thirty days to act or whatever it is. And so in my case, I just sort of thought, okay, look, here's what the rate is. I'm just going to bite the bullet and go ahead and transfer the money. If you spend too long thinking about it, it's a bit like sitting on the fence and wondering when the, when when is a good time to buy into the stock market. When should I buy? Bitcoin. Should I buy it today or should I buy it tomorrow when it's like cheaper or more expensive? And these are the things that keep people up at night. So just make a decision and just go it and stop looking back and regretting the decision if it went wrong and stop patting yourself on the back if it went right. It's just a transaction. It's important to remember as well that the strength of the US dollar and, you know, in respect to the euro and any other currency is all correlated to the borrowing rates in the US. Now, it's really noticeable at the time for me because I was borrowing this money in, I think it was July of 2007. And as you know, 2008 was the year of the big crash. And things started to get a bit shaky at the beginning of 2008. And I can actually see because the Anglo-Irish Bank statement that I have, and I actually still have it here, it gives me the rate of interest that I was paying on the loan. And in January 2008, my loan was at 7% interest. And by November of 2008, my loan was now at 4.4% interest. Uh, so it just gives you an idea how it fell in just the space of you know, 10, 11 months. And, but at the same time, which you've got to remember, so my borrowing costs su substantially dropped in that period of time, which is great. But at the same time, so did the value of the property, so did the value of the loan um, corresponding to euro. And so when it's in a certain currency, there's no point in you really looking at what it's worth in your home currency. Because at the end of the day, you know, you can't influence that. You're paying interest over in that bank over there. The only time it would make a difference is if you weren't collecting rent in US dollars. And if you had to take cash from, say, your paycheck in the euro and transfer to the dollars, then it could make a big difference because your interest rates might have fallen, but the rate of exchange could have gone up. So you could actually end up paying the same amount, even though you're, at a, you're, you're, you're paying less interest, but the currency has swung against you. So you just need to look at all these. In the end, that, that swing from January 2008 to November 2008, it was great for my interest, okay? My payments every month, I was getting in $5,000 from rent and outgoing was reducing and reducing and reducing over that year. So that was great. The loan value as a percentage of the, uh, or, or as it related to euro, was also reducing. So if I had decided to pay off that loan using euros that I had back home, I would have you know, paid much less. But then it was sec secured on the property and the property has fallen in value during that, those interest rates changes as well. So even though I had um, bought the property 1.5 million and it had been worth 1.2 at the time, in 2008, in November 2008, that same property was now worth, in euro terms, just a million. So over 200,000 fall in value um, during that period of time. Now, of course, none of this matters if you plan to hold on to a property long term. It all matters greatly if you're trading and if you're buying and selling and trying to make a profit on these uh, fluctuations in the property market. But this is the thing to remember. If, it's, if you're buying because you want to keep it as your home or if it's just a long term investment, then it shouldn't really matter because the trade, it's only when you actually have to trans, you know, do that exchange rate that it actually matters. Now, remember, none of this, what I've just talked about, all these ups and downs in the property values and stuff, none of that relates in any shape or form to the performance of the property market, okay? The 200,000 reduction was just on currency alone, okay? 1.5 million value in 2005 
versus 1.5 million value in 2008, there was a 200,000 euro drop. But in that same period of time, the real estate market could have shot up or could have shot down. And you would have to add to the, the currency shock, you would have had to add your profit or your loss on the actual uh, local market as well. The point is the property market, let's say it had done really, really well. And as it happens, it didn't do very well because post 2008, everything kind of fell in value. But let's say theoretically, the property had risen by 20% in that period of time. It could have gone up by 200,000, we'll say. I could have actually had a situation where the property has gone up by $200,000, but it's worth exactly the same price that I paid for it because of the exchange rate moving against me at the same time. Now, even worse than that, you could theoretically have a situation where even though the property market has risen nicely, you're actually showing a loss because the currency has gone more than the property market um, has increased. And so you could actually end up at a loss, even though you're theoretically having made a great choice. So anyway, I sold that property in September 2012. And um, when I sold that property, the rates by that stage had fallen back to 0.7947. And so I ended up selling that property at about 30,000 euro less when you take the exchange rate into consideration than what I paid. So about 1.2 million rather than 1.23 million. So not a huge swing either way. I had the benefit of having an apartment in New York for semi, you know, five years or whatever it was. And um, I had the income, the 5,000, although the income was pretty much washed away by the interest payments that I was making. So look, let's get into part two. What are the lessons that you can take from this you know, story and this example and my experience? And how can those lessons be applied to our friend looking at the Irish market now and thinking about you know, paying in US dollars? The first thing I would say is that obviously the fact that we are now at parity, it would seem like a really, really good time to buy in Dublin using US dollars if you're being paid in US dollars. And even better, if you're sitting on a you know, cash pile at the moment and you have theoretically 500,000 US dollars sitting in a bank account in the Cayman Islands, then that 500,000 US dollars is currently worth 500,000 euro. And um, you can buy yourself a decent enough property back in Dublin for 500,000 euro. The same property in January of this year would have cost you 568,000 euro or dollars, I should say. So the 500,000 property in Dublin would have cost you an additional $68,000. And that's how much you've saved if you're in a position to go and buy now while it's at parity. However, you've got to think again about the borrowing. And if you don't have 500,000 lying around, and you actually need to take out a mortgage, well then the likelihood is you're gonna end up taking out a Euro mortgage. For the same reasons I explained earlier that the, the bank is going to want security on the asset. And that means going to an Irish bank. Now you can probably use an Irish uh, broker and they'll you know take all of your information. They'll go off and they'll get you a good uh, rate. You'll need to pay a deposit. And if you paying a deposit, you're obviously gonna be transferring money from US dollars over, now is a really good time to do that. Um, now, obviously, the fact that we've hit parity, it could continue to go up and get stronger even again, so it might be even worth more. But the likelihood is, and this is just my own opinion, you'll have to make your own decisions, but the, the reason that rates, exchange rates for currency, the reason they fluctuate is because of a thing called spread. And if the rates of US, if the borrowing rate in US dollars is has shot up, which it has because they're fighting inflation. And as you probably know, if you're paying attention, the US Fed has been doing making these really dramatic increases in interest payments. And as one of the reasons why a lot of people are worried about the US property market now, because you were able to borrow money at 30 years, for 30 years at 2%. Those same borrowing costs are now 6%. And so um, for 30 years. 
And so that's going to have a dramatic impact. And But that 6% increase is the reason why the dollar has strengthened. You've got global investors who are looking at where can they get their money? Where can they get a good rate of return? And if you're sitting in euro at the moment and you're earning a negative interest rate, which is the current rate in euro, you can put your money into the US and you can earn a couple of percent. So that is a really attractive reason. So put your money into the US dollar and you're going to earn interest on your money as opposed to nothing in the euro. So naturally, everyone is buying dollars to do that. Um, the problem is, is that the euro are also experiencing inflation. So what the euro's zone is going to do is increase the interest rates. And when they do that, the swings will start to come back down again. And so parity probably will be short-lived and then it'll actually swing below and it might end up back kind of where it was before. Hard to say. Who knows? I mean, this is crystal ball stuff. But um, I just think you got to, if you have an opportunity to transfer some funds across a deposit or something like that across now while parity is there, it's probably going to be a good thing because if you wait and things were to go back to how they were in January, it'll cost you an extra, you know, probably 10, 15,000 uh, dollars to do that, to make that delay. So what else have I got to say? I mean, that is pretty much it. The, the one thing that I would say is if you do buy property in a foreign currency, in a foreign place, don't look to get into trading property. I mean, in this case, our friend here who, is, who has asked the question, he's looking to move back to Ireland. So this is a home. And so that being the case, I don't think you should spend too long thinking about it. Of course, it's nice to save some money. And if you can, you know, save 60 or $70,000, go ahead and do that. But don't try to game out the system too much because I have friends who've tried to do that. And I've seen them literally up at night beating themselves up because they delayed on a decision and it ended up costing them. And when you're talking about buying property, the swings can be quite large. I can remember somebody who decided, who held off transferring a deposit on a property in the US. They had euro and they said, no, I'm going to hold off a week. And in that week, the fluctuation prices and stuff like that, I think it cost them 15,000 euro. And I can remember them like really anxious and like angry with themselves. And I can't believe I've, you know, I've lost 15,000 and the reality is, is it could have swung the other way. They could have transferred the money that day and it could have swung the opposite and they'd be giving out to themselves that, why did I do this? And so don't overthink it. You know, we are investors in property. We're not currency speculators. If you're a currency speculator, then you have to kind of wear a completely different hat and you have to study different things. You're looking at, you know, minute by minute changes in the currency market when you're a currency trader. When you're a property trader, you've got all of the purchasing costs that you've got to take on. So it could take years for you to recover those. Remember when I bought my property in New York, 58,000 in closing fees. The mortgage was another 22,000. That's 70 or 80,000 that I paid in costs. Like if the property goes up by 10%, I've only just about got half of that cost recovered, you know? Um, and so there you go. All right, guys, look, I hope that was useful. Um, if and when the time comes uh, that you're buying these properties, good luck with the transaction. I wish you every uh, success. And for everyone else, I will see you this time next week. I'm off on my holidays for a week and uh, taking the family away. And so um, I hope you have a good time and I'll speak to you soon. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Behind the Facade. If you enjoyed today's episode or if you found it useful in any way, please leave a review over on iTunes and or send, you know, send it out to a friend, like share the episode link with a friend who you think might benefit from it, whether they're looking at property or whatever. If you have any questions or other topics you'd like me to cover, please um, connect with me in the Facebook group Behind the Facade community or over social media, just you know, find me on whatever platform you're on. You'll find me using the handle gavinjgallagher.com. You can stay up to date with everything that I'm up to by checking out my website, gavinjgallagher.com, 
and in there you can click on join my tribe and that puts you on my email list so that's all for now guys speak to you all soon <laughs>